Rachel. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm, I'm at Resources for the Future, and you know our mission is basically to try to solve climate change through economic research. And we don't have enough economists. So, if anything I say during my talk, uh, my, my 20 minutes here, 19 and 45 seconds, uh, interests you, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to emphasize is that. You know, the, the problem of climate change uh, has really changed in the last 25 years. What I want to talk about, let's see if this works. Oh, uh, the little, oh, uh, there it is. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Did I do something bad? Click it. There. Perfect. All right, great. The thing that's really changed over the last 25 years has been uh, a movement, as uh, Estelle noted, and actually Rachel as well, towards just thinking about mitigating emissions to really talking about net zero emissions. And I think this has a, a large consequence for what the role of carbon markets are. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of ideas. You know, one is that in the long run, we need to be balancing what remaining emissions there are with whatever carbon removal technologies exist to get the right uh, right balance. Is that good? Okay. Um, a second thing is also thinking about the role of markets during the transition, where, uh, as Rachel was mentioning, a lot of this is really about uh, uh, technology development, uh, and the mitigation is almost uh, a little bit secondary. And I think there is a, a plethora uh, of opportunity. Do I need to like click on the screen, mate? Yeah. All right. Let's see, there we go. So, just to highlight, you know, in 1997, uh, roughly 200 countries got together and signed the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, most of them did not, a lot of them did not ratify it, like the United States. Um, but the idea was to try to get emissions below 1990 levels uh, by around the year 2010. Um, and there was a big focus on global the idea of global emissions trading to try to reduce the cost collectively of achieving that those targets those are also targets only for the richest countries in the world by 2023 you have more than 100 countries including all, all the major emitters like china committing to uh, domestically to reduce their emissions to net zero uh, by mid-century uh, meanwhile there's been uh, arguably less emphasis on global trading although that's that's still there we can come back to that and to just give you an idea of the kinds of policies uh, that are now on the table, as opposed to emissions trading from 20 years ago, uh, in March, the European Union announced that they will no longer sell uh, internal combustion engines by the year 2035. Uh, just today, the EPA released regulations or proposed regulations that would basically require all fossil uh, power plants in the United States to capture and store the air emissions by the year 2040. So you can kind of see that the direction of things is no longer about little mitigation efforts. This is about major uh, efforts to get to net zero. Um, so what does net zero mean? Just to make sure we understand what we're talking about. Basically, uh, at some point by mid-century, any remaining emissions of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere are going to need to be comp uh, compensated by an equal amount of removals from the atmosphere. Uh, and currently, there are several different technologies, uh, and, and Rachel actually covered these rather nicely. Um, first of all, there are what we call nature-based solutions, uh, afforestation, um, and other ways that you capture and store the CO2 from the atmosphere using natural processes and basically leaving them in plants and nature uh, in larger volumes. Of course, uh, when they burn, that does release the CO2. So there is some concern about that. Um, another idea that has been pretty popular is the idea of bioenergy with capture and storage. There, the idea is you, you, know, you grow the biomass, so you kind of capture it from the atmosphere using natural technologies, uh, but then you actually intentionally burn it and store that CO2 underground mechanically in, in various types of reservoirs. Um, and then the third one, which was uh, what uh, Rachel was kind of talking about at the end there, um, or in the middle there, is these direct air capture technologies, which are very experimental. Um, but the idea is that you would literally uh, pull CO2 out of the atmosphere through some sort of mechanical or chemical manner, uh, and then take that captured CO2 and sequester or store it either underground or in some sort of product or something. Um, but as, as Rachel was saying, it's quite expensive. So one key role for market-based policies going forward that no one has really totally figured out um, is that somehow you want to balance the remaining emitters 
uh, in society with these carbon removal technologies through some, presumably some sort of market. And the reason you're gonna wanna do that uh, is first of all, it's gonna be very expensive to do the carbon removal. Um, I don't know, I was thinking around $400 a ton is probably what people are, are thinking about right now, maybe billions or a billion tons of remaining emissions that are gonna to have to be captured this way. If you had to do this through public procurement, it would be quite expensive. So it seems sort of natural that you would require these emitters to actually pay for that removal. So this definitely seems like you know a natural place for markets uh, down the road. But if you think about the transition over the next, um, you know, in the next couple of decades, and for some reason, yeah, the timer doesn't show very well. Thank you. Um, we still, you know, it's not totally obvious we need markets. Um, we can do bans on internal combustion engine sales, or we can require power plants to reduce their emissions. And there is some inefficiency in doing that, um, but it's certainly not as big as it was before because now it doesn't matter. At some point, it's just zero emissions. Uh, so it's really just the transition that you care about. Um, but you could still imagine that there's a desire for flexibility um, during the transition, uh, both to lower costs and uh, to drive technological change. But I think a couple of things, you know, argue for us to think about more creative ways than simply the, the, the kind of traditional cap and trade uh, and taxes that Estelle was talking about, um, partly because what that's going to do in this period of transition uh, is immediately put those very high carbon prices maybe $400 a ton, hopefully not that high, but some high carbon price uh, immediately into product prices because of the inframarginal emissions that they contain. Um, and you might be concerned about this because of equity, you might be concerned about this because of trade, um, and you might be uh, concerned about this because, as uh, Rachel was mentioning, the bigger point is, is technological development, and maybe you don't wanna drive all of this uh, through carbon markets. So I think one of the ways that we can think about uh, you know, markets still being used uh, to drive technological change um, is through flexible performance standards. So uh, the idea of a flexible performance standard um, is that you are you know, in some sense taxing or, other or capping emissions uh, from products or output, but at the same time, you're basically giving away all that revenue uh, in the form of a rebate on the output uh, or the product. Um, so the consequence is you don't raise the product prices by the cost of the inframarginal emissions, you only raise them by the mitigation costs at the margin. Uh, and so it, it's, it doesn't have as many equity consequences, it doesn't have as many trade consequences, um, but it still drives a kind of efficient allocation of resources along those margins and drives technological change. There's a lot of examples of this that uh, you know, we could talk about, starting with the lead phase down in the 1980s, um, but all the way up through the Chinese emissions trading scheme, with, which if you kind of read in the details, uh, is basically a performance standard for the power sector. Um, another thing to re realize, however, is that flexible performance standards raise a whole other set of challenges beyond some of the design ones that Estelle was mentioning. Um, so first of all, you're you have to think immediately about the scope of emissions associated with products. Um, are you just regulating the direct uh, emissions of the manufacturer that's producing the product, or are you thinking about the upstream electricity emissions? Or are you thinking about indirect emissions from other products that enter into the final product that's being manufactured? You know, with cap and trade and, and carbon taxes, you didn't need to worry about that because those were passed through in all the intermediate product prices, but that's no longer happening. So you actually have to think about that a bit more. And you have to worry about whether or not you're inefficiently encouraging uh, you know, substitution into products uh, out of direct emissions where you're really not reducing emissions or solving the problem. Um, another problem you get into is thinking about how you define uh, the metric for the product uh, based allocation or the, the rebate or the standard. Um, you know, as economists and looking at most of our data, most of the data is value, uh, but probably there, it might make more sense to think about weight. Um, and then the question becomes, are you, how do you differentiate uh, across different types of products? 
Um, just a you know, couple of classic examples. Um, you can make iron and steel using blast furnaces or electric arc furnaces, very different technologies. You might say, well, let's just, whichever one is the most carbon efficient, let's do that. But that has re, you know, huge redistributional consequences and may not be available everywhere. Um, another example is in the power sector, you know, do you have differentiated standards for coal and gas plants or a single standard that is just going to push you, you know, whole hog into natural gas? Um, and again, there could be distributional consequences or, or you could be actually trying to encourage technological change within the coal uh, fired power plants uh, to get to net zero. So these are going to be tricky uh, issues that are going to have to be uh, resolved. Another issue that comes up uh, when you start about you start talking about very high levels of mitigation uh, net zero, particularly in the industrial sector, is what to do about trade. Now, if you use the tradable performance standards, you have less of a problem because you're not raising the product prices as much, but you're still going to have higher product prices in the in the jurisdictions that are moving more aggressively. Um, and so this raises the risk that they're, all the pollution is just going to migrate to pollution havens. So in response, uh, countries uh, and jurisdictions like the European Union are implementing border measures where they will tax emissions coming into the union based on, on uh, their carbon content, uh, at least their unpriced carbon content. Um, they don't actually propose to rebate exports, but that's another uh, thing that comes up. Um, and, but again, you run into a lot of these same measurement issues, but now the measurement issues are actually in your trading partners, no longer at home, which makes it more complicated. Another interesting question that arises is uh, whether or not you base your trading part, the, the imported products carbon content on the facility, whether it's manufactured on the entire firm's uh, product line or the entire sector. Um, on the one hand, you'd like to incentivize people to reduce emissions, so maybe you target the facility, but then you might be concerned that, well, you'll simply get the imports from the cleanest facilities and the dirtiest uh, uh, production will go somewhere else. Um, so that's a, a, there's not a perfect answer, but you have to figure out how you're going to balance those things. Finally, I just flagged that this, you know, raises potential uh, trade issues in the WTO. Um, these have been carefully navigated, I think, uh, by the European Union, but the United States has kind of thrown itself into this debate, uh, perhaps without as much concern. Um, and another issue that arises a lot when you talk to uh, other stakeholders is how you do this in a way that's fair to developing countries um, who may not want to uh, move quite as quickly as the richest countries. Um, finally, I wanted to talk uh, just briefly about uh, other market policies because um, we got into this a little bit in the um, with the other uh, talks, um, but I, I wanted to mention some more things or and maybe even raise some issues. So um, uh, I guess Estelle was talking a bit about voluntary markets, and I just find this totally fascinating. I, I did work on this 20 years ago where I said, ah, oh, voluntary markets, maybe you get like a 10% reduction. Uh, so don't spend a lot of time on it. It's kind of summarizing a book. But um, <laughs> meanwhile, now there's like billions of dollars in the voluntary markets. Um, people have projected that it could be a $50 billion market. I'm a little skeptical of that, but you know, it could be a huge market in the future. Uh, businesses seem to be moving beyond what governments are requiring. Um, and the question it really raises for me is how do you leverage this to get as much mitigation as possible? Um, and that doesn't mean making the rules as strict as possible because that may chase away some of the money. These companies have these obligations that they're turning into payments and they wanna be able to claim they're, they're meeting their obligations. So if you make it really hard, they're just not gonna do it. And so somehow there has to be some balancing of thought about how you extract as much money as you can from these do-gooder corporations and channel it into the best possible investments. And I think that is a hugely uh, interesting, and really economists have not waded into this. It's been dominated by the companies who wanna get the cheapest compliance and the environmental organizations who wanna get the strictest rules. There has not been a lot of economics in this. Um, Rachel talked a bit about procurement, so I don't want to get into this, uh, you know, too much, uh, except to say it's fascinating. Uh, this idea, I actually just heard about this um, last week, so maybe you're totally familiar with this, but like with the green cement, or actually this green steel was the example, 
you may have companies that uh, have an obligation you know, to decarbonize their supply chain, uh, but they actually don't have access to the steel that is green very easily. So there's this whole system by which they can pay for green steel over here, divorce the environmental attribute from the steel, just get the environmental attribute. Someone who doesn't care about green steel buys the steel and they apply that environmental attribute to the steel they're buying that's actually not clean. So it's a, it's a complicated market mechanism and I don't necessarily think it's happening as efficiently as it could, but it's a way to kind of, again, capture that corporate ambition and channel it as uh, constructively as possible. Uh, and then I'll just, maybe I'll just end a few minutes early because, um, you know, lunch is on the way and uh, some of us may still need a bathroom break. Um, I think there's a lot of other financing tools uh, that could be on the table here. The government is trying to figure out how to spend something like $50 billion that's been allocated in the uh, in, in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act uh, to encourage technologies uh, that need to somehow interact with the markets that are going to buy these technologies and figuring out how to design these incentives in ways that actually deliver the technologies to markets uh, as efficiently as possible just seems like a huge opportunity. So I will stop there. Thank you.